We're speaking now with Hussein Ibish, senior resident scholar at the Arab Gulf States Institute in Washington. He's a weekly columnist for The National out of the United Arab Emirates, former columnist for Bloomberg, regular contributor to The New York Times and Daily Beast, and frequent contributor to many other U.S. and Middle Eastern publications. Hussein, weekly hello. With the nice to see you again. Weekly with The Atlantic now. Okay, cool. <laughs> and 3X guest on the 966 as well. Third time, I believe, joining us. Nice to see you again. That's what 3X means these days. That's good. So let me let's start off, and and I think the premise is going to be you know the events ongoing in Gaza, uh, and you noted in a Daily Beast article last just late last month that the, the various simmering fronts that have opened up in the Middle East could easily prove as decisive to the direct the trajectory of international relations as the war in Ukraine and growing tensions over Taiwan. Can you uh, elaborate on this? And then we'll get into all sorts of uh, permutations. What I mean by that is that the the um, old Western-dominated, U.S.-crafted, NATO-centric world order that is sometimes called the rules-based order, although the rules, there are, you know, people make exceptions for certain privileged rule breakers like Israel in the occupied territories, Morocco, in the Western Sahara, Turkey, in Cyprus. It's not like everyone has obeyed the rules, right? But generally speaking, there is this sense that the UN Charter and its basic principles, beginning with the inadmissibility of the acquisition of territory by war, especially between UN member states, like Russia's effort to grab hold of parts of Ukraine, when Russia has recognized Ukraine's independence, Ukraine was almost in a way created not by Russia, but by the Soviet Union as a as a Soviet republic, and then gained independence as the Soviet Union broke up in the same way that the Russian Federation did. And they recognized each other. And now there's this irredentist effort to grab parts of Ukraine and to subjugate all of Ukraine. This is in violation of the UN Charter. It's a very like primal example of that. What I meant by the, the three global flashpoints is that this order, if you like it, and there are those who don't like it, but I mean, I think on balance, it's better than the two alternatives, which are uh, absolute chaos, you know, a world in which might makes right. And, and because there is no concept of a structure or a polycentric, uh, a multicentric, uh, multipolar structure in which, again, there are privileged actors like uh, the US and China and Russia and their most important immediate surrogates, Israel might be included in that, uh, or whatever, uh, who can break rules and then everyone else has to obey them. I think both of those are, are less preferable to the the or the post Cold War order that uh, we have inherited, right from from the day from the 1990s, etc. Yes, the U.S. invaded Iraq, but the U.S. role in Iraq is now kind of marginal, and it's supporting an Iraqi government that that deserves support. And it's not like the U.S. has stayed in Iraq indefinitely. The U.S. invaded Afghanistan for uh, obviously for good reasons to get rid of Al Qaeda, uh, but it left. Um, Afghanistan. It stayed way too long, in fact, uh, and it was trying to do something that couldn't be done, which was create uh, an Afghan government that uh, pleased the West rather than pleased Afghans when there were a lot of armed Afghans who wanted something else. Um, I think it's a tragedy for Afghan women, but it's not something that the U.S. can or should be determining. Um, so there was in incredible hubris involved. American mistakes are many. But the order is worth preserving. There are three stress tests going on. One is in Ukraine. The second one, which is sort of in progress, it's being it's being prepped. It's it's uh, sort of in the in the stage of mise en place. Everything is being put together for it. Is Taiwan, and the third stress test is in the Middle East, where Iran is tr is another. It's like a um, a junior member of the revisionist club uh, headed by russia at the moment but uh, dominated by china and with iran and a couple of other junior countries but especially iran as a kind of uh, junior partner uh, in challenging the balance of power in the regions where they are in iran is really thinking about the middle east but also 
with global implications. The question is, what kind of world are we going to live in? Are we going to live in one shaped by Vladimir Putin, Xi Jinping, and uh, the uh, Iranian uh, National Security Council led by Ayatollah Khamenei and the IRGC? Or are we going to live in a world where, uh, you know, which reflects sort of the Western order uh, of the past 40 years? And I, I vote very much for the latter. And I think the, 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 there is a threat to uh, global and regional security uh, should the revisionists and the might makes right crowd succeed. This is what I mean. That provides a very interesting contest. And the rule-based international order, uh, you know, has certainly benefited the U.S. Our point of departure is always the U.S. national interest. Yeah. yeah but also, I, I believe, you know, if you know, our, we focus on Saudi Arabia, I certainly believe a country like Saudi Arabia is very much invested in a rule-based international order. Yeah. I mean, look, the U.S. is the quintessential global status quo power. That's why the invasion of Iraq was such a stupid mistake, because it right. deviated. Neoconservatives had this sort of Trotskyite idea about spreading democracy. I mean, that's why my my brother, my late brother, Christopher Hitchens, one of the closest friends I've ever had, was so excited about that dumb war because he was a Trotskyite. He died a Trotskyite. He wanted international revolution to spread freedom. And he thought, you know, George W. Bush was on the right track by getting rid of Saddam Hussein and, you know, trying to create a democracy in Iraq. And, uh, you know, I was kind of all the time saying this is, you know, madcap. This is insane. This is this is a disaster for everybody. So, my point is, My point is that, look, the U.S. is a quintessentially status quo power. We really want to preserve the the global structures and we want stability and gradual change. Saudi Arabia is the quintessential regional status quo power. It wants stability and gradual change. What, what MBS is doing inside Saudi Arabia is sort of a response to the Arab Spring, which was uncontrolled change from the bottom down. And it, it led to tragedy everywhere. And even in Tunisia, it didn't succeed in democratizing, creating rule of law and accountability and anything like that. The I think the MBS vision, in a way, is to, to um, counterpose that uh, uncontrolled change from the bottom up with controlled change from the top down that can be orderly and also in its own way revolutionary, except in the political sphere where it is absolutely reactionary and, and centralizes power. And so that's a conundrum. But what I'm saying is the US and Saudi Arabia can't break apart, not because of values or we love each other or domestic politics or anything like that, but their strategic goals are absolutely in sync with our strategic goals because both of us are committed to preserving the status quo and are committed to stability and gradual change rather than radical change and instability and uh, moving fast and breaking things. Um, like the, the ultimate version of that are the Houthis uh, who are you know unleashed by Iran, but not controlled by Iran, obviously. We've seen that in recent months and weeks uh, and who are just, you know, uh, uh, who just break stuff. And uh, it doesn't bother Iran when that happens, unless it threatens to drag Iran into a conflict. Uh, other than that, Iran is fine with it. But Saudi Arabia doesn't play this game of militias and armed gangs because, first of all, they want stability, and it's contrary to that. And secondly, because they tried it with us and the Pakistanis in Afghanistan, and we ended up with Al-Qaeda and ISIS. When that happens to Iran, they don't care if they end up creating Frankenstein's monster. It's okay, as long as it's far away from Iran. The Saudis can't do it, we can't do it. It's not the game we play. We play the order and stability game. So we're wedded to each other because we want the same things for different reasons. We need each other, we can't, there's no alternative. The US doesn't have an alternative to Saudi Arabia. And we could talk about why Saudi Arabia is so important to the US geographically and, and economically, but also, Saudi Arabia has no alternative to the United States. China can't provide it what we do. Russia can't provide it what we do. That's it. If they want a partner for their security, it's got to be us. If we want a partner for our aims in in the Arabia, in the, in the environs around the Arabian Peninsula, which I'd be happy to explain what I mean by that, uh, you know, it's us. That's it. So, so <laughs> as ever, we're saying you. You've done a remarkable job and all the, all racing to the end because I want to get back 
in how what I believe Saudi Arabia and the U.S. are very much in sync. But let's let's go let's back. Let, let me let me anchor this right now in in Gaza. Sure. And and you, if you posit that you know Iraq was a, a horrible misjudgment and highly detrimental to our our Absolutely. Absolutely. national interests, which I agree with. Without and that it, it undermined our claims to be supporting uh, a rules-based international order. You're suggesting that this Gaza situation is a similar one. Can you talk about how uh, this administration, President Bush, and we'll go through, if we can, I'd like to go through each of the players maybe. We'll go, we'll go U.S., we'll go Israel, yeah. we'll go Iran, and then we'll end up with Saudi Arabia. Because Saudi Arabia is part of a, a group of Arab states, as well as the U.S., who's really looking at the post-Gaza environment and, and yep. how this crisis might end up being an opportunity. So, right. so can you talk about how you think President Biden has handled this crisis? Okay, yeah, sure. I think very few people really understand the administration's policy, right? Because they begin by talking about Gaza. But that's wrong. The administration looked at this from day one and said, whatever happens in Gaza, we can deal with from an American point of view. Now, this is, let me just say, this is a cold, they have taken a cold-blooded raison d'etat, meaning, you know, like the reasons of state, statecraft, right? Not Nothing to do with morality, right? They've taken a cold-blooded raison d'etat approach to this war. And the operating assumption for the administration from the beginning, in my opinion, uh, in the big picture, has been that the prime directive for the United States is to prevent the war from spreading beyond Gaza. Because if it does, if it spreads into the West Bank and West Jerusalem and, and occupied Jerusalem, right? if it spreads into Lebanon and Hezbollah and its 150,000 rockets and missiles with many of them hyper-precision guidance, which could rain down death and destruction on Haifa and, and the Dimona reactor, and Israel cannot really prevent what Hezbollah would unleash on them. And a, a war between Israel and Hezbollah, which would be devastating to uh, Israel and truly devastating to Lebanon in a, in a categorical way different uh, than the damage Israel would sustain, which would be tremendous, um, it could easily drag in the United States, could easily drag in Iran, could easily produce an American-Iranian violent confrontation, could become the first Middle Eastern regional war in the modern history of the Middle East. We really haven't had a full-blown regional war in the Middle East in its modern history. This has all the makings of that if it can't be contained to Gaza. Now, it the Biden administration pursued that as its main goal. And if you don't understand that, you can't understand why they made the decisions they made in Gaza to support the Israelis. The bear hug they've given to the Israelis is based on Biden's personal inclinations. He's an 80-year-old liberal who therefore is uh, kind of like invested in the idea of Israel as a democracy and an ally. Uh, and number two, He's the leader of a democratic party, which is still very pro-Israel in its in its mainstream. There's a very loud progressive left, but it's a distinct minority. So he defends his own, you know, leadership of the party. Number three, at a partisan level, he fends off uh, Republican attacks that he's insufficiently pro-Israel. Right? He hadn't le left any room for that to to make any sense. And number four, the bear hug has a strategic purpose, which is to allow Biden. First, to say to the Israelis, as he keeps doing, do not attack Lebanon and spread the war. Now, the Israelis are persisting in not only putting ultimatums on the table for Hezbollah to withdraw their forces to the Vitani River, which is like uh, 25 to 30 kilometers north of the border, uh, or they would face a, an all-out assault. Hezbollah isn't interested in that. And there are these French and American proposals on the table, but they haven't gotten anywhere. Um, yet the Israelis are persisting in preparing an attack for the spring, a ground invasion of Lebanon on a massive scale. They want to do this. They are preparing it. The Biden administration is trying to prevent that, and it is necessary to prevent that. And the whole purpose of the bear hug strategically was to lay the groundwork to say, no, if you do this, you're on your own. We were with you in Gaza when you were attacked. Okay, we let you do horrible things. We let you go absolutely crazy. We didn't stop you from a savage war of vengeance, because that's what's going on in Gaza. It is a savage war of vengeance. It's not a genocide yet, but it is a savage war of vengeance. Brutal, 
to its core. Shocking. We haven't seen anything of this scale in, in recent history, anywhere in the world, of this per capita brutality, okay? The killing, half 30,000 people dead, half of them are children, right? I mean, and there are more people under the rubble, a lot more, thousands more. So look, you know, the point is, why would Biden have um, not intervened more firmly to try to stop this? And the answer is because he's preferred to keep those chits to stop Israel from going into Lebanon. This is my understanding, a lot of basis of it uh, for thinking this. And he's going to have to use them and more to stop the Israelis in Lebanon. But this is the basic idea. The war also hasn't spread because Iran doesn't want a broader war. It's very happy with these brush fires. The war in Gaza is fine. Okay, they don't care what happens to Hamas. Hamas is an on-again, off-again ally that is a Sunni Muslim Brotherhood group. It's a, it's a, it has a marriage of convenience with the Iranian alliance, but it's not organic. As we saw in the Syrian war, there was almost a decade where most of Hamas was not talking to the Iranians at all. And a, a remnant of the Qassam brigades uh, and Saleh al-Aruri, who got whacked in Beirut right, with that drone strike, he was maintaining ties with the Iranians, but it was a small faction within Hamas. Most of them fled. They all fled uh, Damascus, where they had their headquarters. They had to leave. They went to Qatar, except Saleh Haruri, who went to Beirut and Ankara and assembled. He was toggling between those places. The rest of them went of the Politburo, went to Doha because they couldn't stay in Syria. So the on again and off again ally. And, and Gaza is not culturally, religiously, symbolically, um, strategically important to Iran. They can afford to lose this stuff. They don't care. They don't care what happens. The Red sea, Houthi mayhem in the Red Sea is useful to them. It makes the point again, like they did during the year of maximum resistance, where there's all that gray zone warfare in the, in the Gulf itself with limpet mines uh, above the waterline and all that stuff, designed to send a message from Iran, which is, hey, if we are not part, we and, and also our allies, really, our, our, our network, are not part of maritime security arrangements, there isn't going to be one. And also, if we can't feel free to sell our oil and ship it around the world, no one else can feel secure in shipping and buying and selling unmolested for sure. Like they might get screwed up in the Babel Mandab Strait by our guys, the, the Houthis, if, if we feel like we're being prevented from selling our products. And this is a useful message. So these brush fires are, are good for Iran, uh, unless and until Qatar Hezbollah, open quote, gets lucky, close quote, or manages somehow to kill a bunch of Americans in Tower 22 in northern Jordan. That was really bad. The Iranians pulled the plug right away. They sent a senior diplomat to Iraq to tell Qatar Hezbollah to suspend all military activities. They, they announced that. Kataib Hezbollah said, we, we are suspending all our military activities. But in the same announcement, they said, our um, brothers around the world, especially in Iran, do not understand how we conduct our jihad. In other words, they were mad. And they were, they were, um, they were going along with the orders, but they were disgruntled and they said so. My point is this. The Iranians don't want a broader war. Hezbollah doesn't want a war with Israel right now. It's, it's a very bad idea for them. But the Israelis are pushing it. So the problem for the United States and for Saudi Arabia is that the chief U.S. ally in the region is doing more right now to destabilize the region and to challenge the American goal of containing the war to Gaza, which is Israel's... Uh, preparations to invade Lebanon and Israel's ultimatums to Hezbollah and its constant escalation with Hezbollah. And this is, it, it's a conundrum, right, for the United States, because you would think that the biggest threat is the Houthis or Kataib Hezbollah, but it's not. The Houthis are, yeah, they're conducting piracy, but there's a, there's a limit to what they're doing. The Iranians are trying to get them to stop. They won't stop, but it's not that big a threat. It's it's something that can be dealt with at this point. Uh, Kataib Hezbollah is backed up entirely. Uh, Hezbollah doesn't want a war. Who, who is uh, the party that's escalating and threatening a regional war is actually Israel. And um, 
that's a big conundrum for for everybody, for the United States, and a big threat to Saudi Arabia. Well, and and you you cover it nicely, and it is fascinating to see how very much actually in sync Iran and the U.S. are in trying to contain this. Well, they share that goal. Yeah, yeah, and that that response to the uh, the attack in Iraq was was notable. You know, immediately. You know, this was we want to harass you. We don't want to kill yeah, personnel. Exactly. Yeah, they want to harass us. They don't want a war with us. They will they will lose everything. And actually, what they think is what they say. If you read the Iranian press and the Iranian internals, they say we are winning. We are winning this war. And the only thing, if it becomes a regional war, Netanyahu wins and we will lose. And so we must prevent a regional war. And I think it's true that, that that's what they think. And I think that's what Netanyahu thinks. And so he wants a regional war. But the United States does not require, need, or in any way benefit from a regional war in the Middle East. If Israel does it, we don't. And uh, that's a point that needs to be made again and again and again. Biden is right that that a regional war is a horrible idea for the U.S. So let's talk about Israel. And and I think I'm in agreement. Um, you, you know, the, 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 the bear hug was, was strategic. For, for specific reasons to try and contain this first order of business contain this uh the the war of vengeance undertaken now in gaza and the the carnage the inhumanity of it all is is now taking an extraordinarily uh great extraordinary great toll on on, on the u.s reputation in the region and and any number of things so so how do we square this circle? You have Biden who wants to achieve one thing, but you have Israel. What is Israel's point of view? What do they hope, you know, as, as my, my understanding is after every attack, Israel's population moves right, but already the government was very far right. And of course we've got yeah. Netanyahu. Yeah. But I'm not so sure. I'm not sure about that. I don't think we know. I think we assume that. And I assume that. And, um, you know, I, I, I'll believe that until I see otherwise. However, the Israelis I talk to who are very smart and they're not, like Pollyannas or people who with rose-colored glasses, they're not sure that Israel is going to go to the right. Uh, they're not sure where the Israeli public is going to end up on this because people may be furious about Hamas's uh, killing spree in southern Israel on October 7th, which was a catastrophe and, and a, an act of extraordinary brutality. However, uh, the Israeli public must realize at some point that it was exactly Netanyahu's policy of divide and rule of the Palestinians that produced this attack. It's not just a question of the occupation not ending and people becoming desperate and enraged and all that, which is true. It's more that, um, first of all, he had a policy of keeping Hamas in power in Gaza, but contained and uh, and cut down to size with these regular wars, which he called they call mowing the grass, meaning cutting Hamas down to size, uh, you know, sort of on a regular basis, uh, uh, but keeping Hamas in power in the West Bank and keeping Fatah dominated groups, the, 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 the Palestinian Authority and the PLO in power in the West Bank. So you have a divided Palestinian comedy polity and they can't therefore achieve a Palestinian state. And Netanyahu said this explicitly in 2019 at a meeting of Likud party Knesset members is that everybody who wants to prevent the creation of a Palestinian state, meaning us, um, Likud, has to support keeping Hamas in power in Gaza and getting money to it, not Israeli money, but Qatari money and other money, right? And, and, and sustaining it so that the Palestinians are divided and that way we can prevent the creation of a Palestinian state. It's very cynical. And you know, so Israel has two groups of Palestinians it can deal with. The Palestinians who want to talk to Israelis and make a deal for a state in the, who are in power in the West Bank, or the Palestinians who want to kill Israelis who are in power in Gaza. And they, they treated them equally and kept them in power and set up the situation where they got October 7th. And, the, you know, at some point you have to realize, like, truly, um, this system is not going to work. Now, my fear is that the Israeli response to all of this is going to be what I think has been inevitable since the failure of Camp David in 2000, in the summer of 2000. You remember with, with Clinton and Barack and Arafat, and it failed. 
And at that point, after that failure, you have to ask yourself a question. Israel could not get the Palestinians to agree to peace on Israeli terms. The United States took Israel's side after the failure of the conference. We got the Clinton parameters, which was totally different than the Israeli proposals. But it was it was released after the summit, which is crazy, right? So at the summit, Barack's proposal was just parroted by the Americans. It was awful performance, despicable performance. And what ended up happening is that, uh, uh, you know, the, it, 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 the Israelis were not able to secure peace on their terms with the PLO. The PLO had expected, the Palestinians had come to expect that the same terms of peace that were offered and, and secured with Egypt and with Jordan, that is to say, the return of territory, all or almost all of the territory in exchange for peace with Israel would be on the table for them too. And they found out it wasn't. And they weren't being offered a, a regular state, a normal state. They were being offered some kind of weird like uh, archipelago of semi-autonomous things with demilitarization, which they didn't want an army, but with all kinds of restrictions on their sovereignty and all kinds of Israeli control. And it was not acceptable to them. So you have to ask yourself a question. Like, what do human beings do? When human beings are, are in collectivities, right? they don't think like rational individuals. Rational individuals can have enlightened self-interest. But polities, large groups of people thinking together, tribal groups, right? Uh, nation, national groups, whatever, they don't think with enlightened self-interest. They think like toddlers. And if a toddler really, 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 really wants something and no one can prevent them from taking it, by force, you know what they do? They take it. And I really think this applies to much of the West Bank. No one is going to convince Israel to give it up, and no one is there to stop them from just taking it. And so I have expected since the failure of Camp David that at some point in the aftermath of that, Israel will try to draw unilateral new borders in the West Bank that suit their interests, that give them what they require in terms of territory, wholly sacred, historically necessary territory in the West Bank, and probably expel large numbers of Palestinians from places like Hebron, the most populated city in, in the West Bank, and other areas. And so I, I think we're on a fast train now towards annexation and expulsion, and it's very dangerous for the United States, and it puts normalization between Israel and Saudi Arabia, which is the linchpin of American policy, into the zone of impossibility. You mentioned Israeli terms. Yes. And inevitably, it seems, Israeli terms are unacceptable to anybody who's in a, in a negotiation with them. And this is something Netanyahu said. He said on the Abraham Accords, he, he glowingly said, we got something for nothing. Right. He very specifically said, you know, we changed the On whole the dialogue. Palestinian front, that is true. Well, exactly. He, as he said, we gave up not a single span, and and so so that's Israeli terms. And of course, we, as we know, in much of the region, the, the Abraham Accords obviously they haven't been rescinded by the UAE and Bahrain in particular, and they won't be. But the po the, the, the population is not happy with it. it. It's not something that's been very satisfactory. But so let's talk about the sort of prospect of Saudi normal normalization with Saudi Arabia. Which, Saudi Arabia can't accept those terms, right? So UAE and, and Bahrain are different, but they had their own reasons for doing this. Like Bahrain, for Bahrain feels under a suspended death sentence from Iran and not the Islamic Republic, Iran Tutkort, Iran as Iran, uh, because the Shah tried to grab Bahrain when Bahrain was coming independent. And it took British and American naval power to fend him off. And then he recognized Bahrain. But in you know, during the year of maximum resistance, again, back to Trump, thank you so much, Donald, um, he caused all kind of mayhem. One of the things that resulted from his incompetent shenanigans in the Middle East was that um, uh, the Iranian official, quasi-official press, especially those associated with the IRGC, began uh, the Revolutionary Guard Corps and the Quds Force, the Expeditionary Force. They started saying, that Bahrain is part of Iran, and that the worst thing the Shah ever did, and they hate the Shah, they really, like, they endlessly trash on the Shah. The worst thing he ever did was to recognize the independence of Bahrain. 
And the Bahrain is a province or a part of a province of Iran. And so for the Bahrainis, uh, teaming up with the country that's doing the military heavy lifting against Iran's so-called axis of resistance, network of armed gangs that it maintains throughout the Middle East, is a no-brainer. I mean, why wouldn't? Of course they're going to do that. So they did. For the UAE, they're looking for a partner in all kinds of different high-tech security stuff. UAE and Israel share a, a, a profile that is unique to them in the Middle East. They are small states with small manpower, very few people, relatively, but a big military footprint. So they need the same thing. They need missile defense. They need early warning radars. They need um, imaging. They need all kinds of signal intelligence. They need uh, space exploration. They, 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 their security needs are the same. And also, at the R&D that the UAE is doing, they're looking for a partner in the region. The only country that does that same kind of stuff is Israel, which is about 1.5 generations or two generations ahead of the UAE. UAE, but the UAE is similarly ahead of, of the rest of the Arab world. So, uh, you know, they're looking for a partner. Iran doesn't, they can't partner with Iran. Turkey doesn't do this stuff, not in the same way. Turkey has a big military, big population. They don't have the same needs. So they partner with Israel. They get a lot of what they want. They're not looking to the U.S. It's very different for Saudi Arabia. Saudi Arabia has not only, is it mainly looking to the U.S., it's also a big country with a big population and real politics that, that you don't see, it's contained in Bahrain by force. And it doesn't really exist in the UAE in the same way. Um, so what you end up with then is a, uh, a situation where Saudi Arabia would be taking a big risk to normalize with Israel. Right? It would be putting a lot of that in stress. The other thing is Saudi Arabia has leadership roles that the UAE and Bahrain don't have. Saudi Arabia has an Arab leadership role regionally and a global Islamic re leadership role, which is under, under contest. The, the Arab one isn't really under contest because the traditional centers of power, uh, Baghdad, Cairo, and Damascus, are, are in no position to, to exercise this leadership. But on the Islamic global front, there's Turkey, there's Iran, Malaysia, Indonesia, Pakistan, who can contest either in groups or as uh, individuals contest Saudi uh, religious authority. So there's a lot of tension there. And you know they have to be very careful. Uh, there's a lot more at stake. The calculation is much more difficult. So I have been telling my Israeli friends for the past decade or more that they need to understand that the cost of normalization with Saudi Arabia is a commodity, like the price of gold. It can go up and it can go down. The price can be higher or the price can be lower. They seem to believe that the price would just keep going down and end up like the Abraham Accords at zero for the Palestinians. Okay, that's not the case with Saudi Arabia. The price was quite lower three years ago than it is today. And about two years ago or three years, well, let's say five years ago, it was the lowest, I would think. And then during maximum resistance, which is the last year of the Trump administration, so two, four years ago, it went up. It went up a bit and there more was needed. And now it's gone up a lot. So what you had during the past, uh, you know, year and a half or a, three quarters of a year is a situation where um, in the summer of last year, uh, through Tom Friedman's column, uh, the idea was floated publicly that had been in, in the works privately that there would be a triangular agreement between the U.S., Saudi Arabia, and Israel involving Saudi normalization with Israel, right? And what you had then was um, in the summer and early fall until October 7, parallel negotiations. Saudi and Israel did not negotiate together. They both negotiated with Washington. Saudi was negotiating with Washington on a new defense agreement and U.S. Um, involvement support for Saudi nuclear energy production because Saudi Arabia mines its own uranium and one, two, three agreement won't work for them. They need, they need a different regime because they're unique as a non-nuclear weapons power in mining their own uranium for energy production. It's, it's complicated, but trust me, listeners, it, it's, they need a different deal. But they want to work with the Americans because they don't want this to mess up the relationship. The U.S. and Saudi had, by October 7th, the U.S. and Saudi had more or less resolved all their differences on the bilateral front. The deal, the, the um, uh, defense agreement was going to look something like 
Japan and South Korea's deals that they got in the early 50s, less than NATO, but something in writing that committed the US to defending Saudi Arabia under certain conditions, right? And vice versa. A mutual defense treaty ratified by the Senate. The Saudis want to get it in writing because we have been perceived by all our Middle Eastern allies, including the Israelis, the Emiratis, and the Saudis, as unreliable, unpredictable, etc. So they want it in writing. And they also want it in writing and ratified by the Senate to protect them from changes in presidential leadership, right? So the JCPOA, right? It's in, under Obama, it's good. And then Trump comes in and he rips it up. And so you want something that at least is taken as far as you can, which is rat Senate ratification. So they had more or less agreed on that. And they had more or less agreed on the nuclear thing, which if you want details, I can tell you, but it doesn't matter. They had agreed uh, more or less. There was essentially a deal done. They were about to really start on the significant Palestinian component because they really hadn't gone anywhere with Netanyahu and his uh, rice, racist Jewish supremacist friends in his in his uh, insane cabinet. Uh, but they hadn't tested things yet. Could Israel change its cabinet? Could Netanyahu bring in Benny Gantz and have a different group of people? If they put it on the table, what was possible? And, you know, the Gaza war ended all of this. The Saudi reaction to Israel's attack on Gaza, uh, inevitable attack on Gaza, was to announce a pause in all negotiations. But in January, mid-January, early to mid-January, the Saudis started publicly saying, especially the foreign minister, we are still interested. We want to do this. But they said, we need Israel to acknowledge the creation of a Palestinian state. Israel has never publicly, formally accepted the Palestinian right to a statehood or the need to establish a Palestinian state. And that now is the ask. It is also the ask of the Biden administration. My last piece for The Atlantic, which was, um, it was earlier this week, um, it, um, you know, whatever, uh, I know podcast listeners, or whatever, it was, it was recent. <laughs> and uh, it was about how the US and Saudi Arabia want and need a Palestinian state and Israel won't have it. And Netanyahu says no. He got the cabinet to vote no, and he got the Knesset to vote no. So Israel is more opposed to Palestinian statehood today than it has been any time since 1993, which is an amazing thing. But that's where we are. And this is the problem for Saudi Arabia. Like they really want to formalize relations with us uh, in terms of our military understandings and uh, so that they can do their nuclear energy production without rattling us, and we want that, and everybody's on side, even the PLO was willing, and the PA, the chairman of the PLO and the president, the president of the PA was there and saying, oh, all right, fine, you know, whatever. You know, um, everything was working, but the Israelis wouldn't budge, be not because there's anything wrong with Israel, but because they have an extremist government, right? They have more in common with Yahya Sinwar, than they do with anybody in, uh, else in the Palestinian side. They, they, Netanyahu and Sinwar are enjoying this war in Gaza. And anyone, so far, who, so far, anyone who doubts, hold on, well, one, let me finish. Anyone who doubts that Hamas is very pleased with the situation needs to consult the Wall Street Journal uh, from two days ago, a, a story about how Hamas thinks it's winning that cites Yahya Sinwar's message to other Hamas leaders in, in Qatar and in Lebanon saying, everything is great. We have these drugs exactly where we want them. This is fantastic. And that's what he thinks. A very important point, just for our listeners and viewers, who is Yahya Senor? Ah, uh, yeah, of course. That, that's a good point. He is the Hamas leader in Gaza. He really is the political leader of Hamas, and he's the one in control. The guys in Qatar are the Politburo. They're the titular leaders, but they're basically Hamas's diplomatic wing. They don't make decisions for Hamas as an organization. That's done by Sinwar and the military chief, Muhammad Dev. Uh, so Saudi, U.S.-Saudi relationship and coming from, you know, from so much you know, ink spilled on, on how Biden initially approached the Saudis and the sort of the, 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 the you know, the, the non-handshake uh, visit with the MBS. But so, but so, the, so I, I wanted to, what's fascinating here, Hussein, is how in sync Saudi Arabia and the U.S. are on this. 
And in my sense is, and if you can corroborate this or blow it up, is that in the course of talking about what Saudi Arabia wants and those engagements, you know, both prior to October 7th and subsequent to October 7th, have really expanded and deepened the relationship with the U.S. because there's a better understanding. The U.S. has a better grasp of where it needs to get to and what, how it can do that. Is, it, it, is, and, and also, now that act, after October 7th, again, Saudi Arabia, U.S., very much in sync. Let's contain this. Let's keep it local. And let's think about that uh, the, the day after. Can you elaborate on this? Yeah, I think that is true. Um, I think it's fragile because if we cannot get this triangular agreement done, the Saudis may start to increasingly, like the UAE, look for alternatives to the United States. Right now, the Saudis are still trying to solidify their relationship with us. That's their primary goal. And if you look at all the deals they've done with China, which are many since the Xi Jinping visit to uh, Riyadh and uh, uh, China supposedly formally brokering the rapprochement, the diplomatic rapprochement between Saudi Arabia and Iran, uh, although really a lot of the heavy lifting was done by Oman and especially by Iraq, mainly by Iraq, right? Uh, but, you know, you need a great power to sign off on this stuff. It's not like China is in any position to guarantee anything. They can't. But, you know, it was a big, you know, kind of like hullabaloo. And the point is, the Saudis know what America's unstated red lines are. The U.S. unstated red lines are don't give Beijing any undue strategic advantage in the region. Don't let them build any military facility. No dual use ports and air airstrips and things like that. No, nothing that increases their signals intelligence, nothing that gives them uh, a new uh, vista into uh, confidential conversations and things like that. It's pretty basic, right? You can do whatever you want to. Just don't give the Chinese a strategic toehold or foothold in the Gulf region. The reason for this, I, I really want to explain why this is such a big deal. All right. In in the first of all, I want to say after the Ukraine invasion, a lot of um, strategic planners in the U.S. and elsewhere pulled out their maps, their global maps, and started calculating the balance of power globally, right? Because this is a global crisis that causes a full reevaluation. And it became obvious to a lot of people that one of the biggest, if not the biggest, probably the biggest geostrategic advantage that the United States has over its main rival, which is China, uh, and when I say geostrategic, I don't mean international relations. I mean the politics of geography. I mean the strategic uh, value of places, right? I'm talking geography here. Not it, it, I'm using the term in its literal, actual meaning, geostrategic, the strategy of geography. If you look at the map, there are eight primary global checkpoints, three of them. Are, are surrounding the Arabian Peninsula, which is absolutely dominated by Saudi Arabia in geographical terms. The Strait of Hormoz at the mouth of the Persian slash Arabian Gulf, the Bab al Mandab Strait at the mouth of the Red Sea, and the Suez Canal at the mouth of the Mediterranean to the Red Sea and vice versa. And to get a sense of how important this is to global shipping, remember what happened when a ship went sideways in the Suez Canal for like three days? It screwed up global markets royally. It was only a few days, just a couple of days, and it was a disaster. Look, 40 plus percent of China's energy imports come through the Strait of Hormoz. Think about that. More than 40 percent of their energy imports come through the Strait of Hormoz. Just let that sink in. And then more than 40 percent of their manufactured exported goods aimed at Europe and the West and North America come through the Bab al Mandab Strait and the Suez Canal into the Mediterranean. Right? It's their it's their arteries, the arteries of the heartbeat of the Chinese economy. What comes in as energy and goes out as manufactured goes through those places. The alternative is a much more expensive and in some ways dangerous trip around the Cape of Good Hope off of South Africa's coast. The, the, these 
Like the Suez Canal was was made by the French, you know, 150 years ago or whatever, uh, it, precisely in order to create this. And geography made it so for the Bab el-Mandab Strait and the Strait of Hormuz. It, it, we the the bottom line is our military presence in these areas, naval especially, is largely the result of things like the Iraq War and other factors that were not focused on global commerce as the primary focus. But wake up, folks. It is now. The choke points give the Arabian Peninsula a remarkable degree of strategic importance to the United States and conversely to China. We are there. We dominate all three of them. Right? The Houthis, when they mess with international shipping in the Bab el-Mandab Strait, they are challenging maritime security, which we are, we, the British and others in this 40 country coalition, which includes Bahrain, but no other Arab country, but has de facto a membership. None of the literal states of the Red Sea are part of it. But in effect, like so the other literal states are de facto members. Saudi Arabia, Egypt, Israel are all de facto members of this coalition that is um, claiming to protect international shipping from the Houthis. My point is the Houthis are messing with us, with our global strategic interests, with our uh, ability to have control to keep the faucet open. Right? It's not, not to close the faucet, but to keep that faucet open. And having China depend on us, and a lot of other countries in East and South Asia, depend on us for this is really a, a crucial strategic competitive advantage in great power rivalry with China. All right, case mate, if that's true, we need a partner. Saudi Arabia is our partner because Saudi Arabia is the one country that has coastlines on the Persian slash Arabian Gulf, the Arabian Sea, and the Strait of Hormuz, in the Bab el Mandab Strait, in the Red Sea, near the Suez Canal. It's all over. Why? Because these are the waters surrounding the Arabian Peninsula. And it's not far for, from the fourth of eight global checkpoints, which is up near Turkey. But anyway, my point is we need the Saudis. We need the Saudis. I, unless, I, you know, they're on all three choke points. You know, you referenced Thomas Friedman earlier, and, and, and you have said before that Tom Friedman plays a very important role, whether you disagree with him or agree with him. But in his most recent article, he'd been in the region, and this is what he said. I'm going to quote Tom. Friedman, I don't think Israelis or the Biden administration fully appreciate the rage that is bubbling up around the world, fueled by social media and TV footage over the deaths of so many thousands of Palestinian civilians, particularly children. Um, Hamas has much to answer for in triggering this human tragedy, but Israel and the U.S. are seen as driving events now and getting most of the blame, unquote. So how, you know, how long can the Biden administration sustain this? Not long. Um, you see how Biden is now using the word ceasefire. I mean, it's been a gradual increase, turning up the temperature on the Israelis. Um, the death toll in Gaza has actually gone down a lot uh, because of the pressure Biden has exerted on the Israelis to cut out this sort of scorched earth policy. So it was about in in January, deaths were about half of what they were in December. This just, is not, just as you as you as you as you know better than anybody for for Arabs, and that's right. This is a distinction without. Well, I understand a that. I'm I'm right. I, no, I get. That. Look, public opinion is lost in the Arab world for a while. Um, uh, governments, however, have to achieve things. So that's where we're going to have to rely on things. We were relying on public opinion. We'd be screwed. But we're not because we're dealing with governments that have to look past emotions and uh, deal with statecraft. And what I'm getting at here is that Biden hasn't been he hasn't given the Israelis a total carte blanche. It he's let them do much more than he should have. And I think he's he he's his decision making on Gaza has been guided by two things that have not helped him contain the death toll in Gaza. One, or, or 
constraint is around Gaza. One is the political angles that I talked about before, right? The Democrats internally, the Democrats and the Republicans, his own personality, all that stuff, you know, has helped, has, has helped. And he's looking at the election calendar and a lot of that's in play. The second thing is, you know, um, this, this idea that if you support Israel and Gaza, you can prevent them from going on a rampage elsewhere. Um, in other words, looking at the Israeli amygdala reaction to uh, October 7th, through the lens of the American um, rage reaction to 9-11, where we ended up invading Iraq and doing something incredibly stupid that played it, you know, that rewarded Al-Qaeda with uh, a war that rescued them from oblivion. Like when they were driven out of, of uh, Afghanistan, they were virtually gone. And Iraq was the crucible in which Al-Qaeda reformed and became ISIS. And, you know, it's a, you know, it's a blunder basically. And we're trying to prevent the Israelis from blundering into Lebanon and doing something unnecessary, stupid, uh, at the very least premature, and completely uh, unjustifiable from a rational point of view. Um, and so I don't, Biden, in a sense, you know, uh, he has been looking at it from, from that point of view, from kind of the government's point of view. So I think the rage issue is a problem. But He's also got a problem domestically with the progressives, Arab Americans, American Muslims, etc. I don't think it's going to be a big factor in the election, but uh, obviously people needed to get it off their chests at a minimum in Michigan, and they did. You know, it got quite a lot of not committed. I mean, it may may even reach twenty percent. So um, there's a message to him. He's got to do what he can to bring this war to an end. Now, um, the Israelis are going to do something in Rafa. But they're not allowed to do it until they remove the 1.2 million people they have driven into that area and create a safe space for them. They cannot push them into Egypt. That's out. They uh, can either, uh, uh, you know, allow a pause that uh, allows people to return to Gaza City and places like that, which will be more orderly than Rafa, or they can help. Frankly, uh, you know, um, the um, uh, UNRWA, which they hate and are railing against whatever, but there's no one else, to create a new greenfield place with tents and whatnot and water and food and basic medicine for these people to go uh, in order to clear it so the Israelis can do their last military action and get out. The problem is Netanyahu doesn't want to get out. He wants to stay permanently. And that's what Hamas wants. Hamas wants Israel to stay permanently. They both want a, a permanent war. And Netanyahu wants to extend the war to Lebanon while he's at it. And he believes this. He believes that in order to stay out of prison, he needs to stay in power. And in order to stay in power, he needs the war. Yahya Sinwar believes that he too, to, to stay in power, needs to keep the war going and stay alive. And even if he doesn't, stay alive in order to pursue his cause, he needs Israel to stay in Gaza. Both of them want, want Israel to stay in Gaza. The only two people who really want this war to continue, as is or get worse, are the, Yahya Sinwar and Benjamin Netanyahu and the people around them. I'm not just saying individuals. It's factions, right? These are the factions that, that want the war. So the only two groups of people who could end the war are the two people who want to keep it going. And that's the conundrum. It's a big problem facing Saudi Arabia and the United States, and the, they're going to have to work together to solve it because they need the deal with, with the Israelis. They need it, but they can't have it with this version of Israel. Hussein, one more question. We talked about it before we started recording this podcast. Christopher Hitchens, brilliant writer, died 12 years ago, uh, maybe, a, yeah. yes, maybe a few more months than 12 years ago. Actually, my wife, it's funny because when you mentioned it, my wife got me A Hitch in Time, which is a new book with his essays that are yeah. out. I haven't That's gotten the chance to read it yet. Books. Yeah. Yes, yes. How much is his voice missed today? No, oh, it, it desperately missed. So Hitchens was, um, I don't think he was a great guide to what to do and not do. Like his policy suggestions were not his best thing. 
though he was often right, but he was often wrong. It's not the point. The point is he was a voice of moral clarity. He was a voice of reason, literally. He was a defender of reason, of rationale. He was an opponent of superstition and uh, faith belief. He wanted to know why things were the way they were. And he was a an idealist. He was a visionary. He believed in freedom. He believed in equality. He believed in human decency. He believed it was innate. He didn't think you needed a, a clay tablet to tell you not to kill and murder and rape. He thought people, most people, non-sociopaths, unlike the former president who was trying to become the president again, have some you know, innate empathy and innate understand that human beings only exist in the world because we cooperate and respect these basic boundaries, moral boundaries, and that as a species, our c competitive advantage with all other species is that we cooperate like this, and we think things through, and we talk about it, and all that stuff. So Hitchens' voice is desperately missed. His abilities as a raconteur, his joie de vivre, he loved life, and that that's missed, I think. So he was he was a towering figure, and uh, we we clicked right away. The first time I met him, I was a third wheel at a lunch at twelve, and uh, the uh, guy who brought me left at one. And Hitchens and I stayed until 1030 when his wife said, you've been with that guy for like more than 10 hours. So you got to come home now. And after that, we were very, very close until he died. And we hit it off right away. He was a great friend. He was a beautiful man. And a wonderful writer. Hussein Ibish, senior resident scholar at the Arab Gulf States Institute in Washington. Hussein, it's always a pleasure when you join us on the 966. This time was especially so. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you, and thank you for asking me about Christopher. I miss him dreadfully. <laughs>